Okay, I start today's lecture. Uh, the today's lecture title is Collective Imaging from Correlation of PET and Genomic Data to Single Cell Level Analysis. So maybe the topic of this lecture series may be the collective imaging for uh, many types of the cancer, particularly GU cancer or lung cancer. And I heard that previous lectures include these types of cancers. And maybe these lectures include some uh, current or previous, uh, previous studies uh, for the collation between genomic data and PET parameters such as SUV, but I'll uh, deal with deeply uh, these types of the collation analysis uh, between the PET and genomic data. And I will share some of my idea and perspectives of uh, PET and Theranostics law in the precision medicine. So this is the contents of this today's lecture. And firstly, I'll briefly introduce the genomic correlate of the functional imaging. And it's, I there is some, uh, its importance in the precision medicine. Okay, let's start from the principle of nuclear medicine. Maybe you may well know that uh, the core principle of nuclear medicine is diagnostics. And theranostics is started from the base biology. The nuclear medicine, nuclear medicine is started from the iodine therapy, and it is it is on the right biology of the NIST expression. Uh, the NIST expression in the cytocyte is very specific, so we can use iodine light radioisotope for the imaging and therapy of thyroid cancer and thyroid disorders. That was the start point of the nuclear medicine. So we start from the biology and we can get imaging uh, from the underlying biology and we use these types of specific radio tracers, basic specific tracing technology to the therapy. So after the 30 or 40 years of the iodine therapy, we in nuclear medicine, we developed some new diagnostic agents such as uh, Dota Tate or Dota Talk, uh, which is specific specifically bound to the uh, somatostatin receptor. And recently we use these types of tracer for imaging and therapy. And one of the most important tracer FTC is started from the biology of tumor metabolism or brain or cardiac metabolism. So we, our core principle is trace the biology for imaging and therapy. So this is a core principle, but uh, in our departments, there has been a great debate, such as uh, this a great debate in Ronaldo and Messi. This was another great, great, great debate in our department is that what the best modality is for the cancer imaging. At around 2000 to 2010, uh, there was a debate uh, for the best modality in the cancer imaging. Uh, more specifically, PET versus MRI or PET versus CT, CT imaging. So it reflects, PET reflects the functional imaging and uh, MR or CT represent the uh, structural imaging with high resolution. So there was a great debate, but the winner was the fusion imaging. After the 2010, many fusion, fusion uh, modalities such as PET-CT, PET-CT or PET-MRI have been developed, and these types of controversy and these types of debate was ended. So the best modality was fused imaging, like this. But uh, so in at that time we uh, installed PET MRI in our hospital, Seoul National University Hospital, and we studied many, we investigated many studies for uh, for the. Uh, performance of the fusion imaging and the additive value of the fusion imaging for uh, uh, the integrating PET information and MR information. So maybe we expect that the uh, uh, renaissance of the fusion imaging, but many things are changed after the end of the 2010. And currently new paradigm was busy. It was precision medicine. It was different from the imaging modality many other, other, uh, other new technologies for the diagnosis or therapy uh, has been changed by new techniques such as NGS, next generation sequencing. 
genome or transcriptome or proteome or metabolome uh, have changed many, uh, many treatment strategy for the cancer therapy. So recently many uh, oncologists and many surgeons uh, use these types of precision pre medicine principle for the treatment and for the diagnosis. The reason why the new, uh, new, new diagnostic modality have been introduced is NGS technology is cheaper, much cheaper than previous. This is the cost per genome acquisition. So recently we uh, we acquired just one thousand dollar for the whole axon for whole genome sequencing for the cancer patient or for the normal healthy healthy volunteers. It is rapidly grown. So previously, just around ten years ago, uh, we cannot get whole genome sequencing for the cancer each cancer. So it was very challenging. However, recently we easily get. Uh, some whole genome or whole transcriptome data from the uh, for, for the each patient, each cancer patient. So it provides a lot of information for the cancer for each cancer. So for example, we can we cannot we can we can understand the region of the cancer development, or we can uh, we can understand why the cancers are aggressive for each patient level. So the individualized and precision medicine uh, is started from the NGS technology. So these types of NGS technology changed a lot of things in the strategy of the cancer therapy. So many, many data, databases are uh, collected. So many uh, researchers investigated this database and we know a lot of things of the cancer origin and the cancer development and metastasis uh, from this database. So we can use these types of the biology to the clinical medicine. So in the near future, precision medicine and precision oncology is, uh, is maybe uh, in the near future, it will be uh, change many things in the treatment strategy. This is a good example of the strategy of the cancer patient treatment in individual level. If patients are diagnosed as cancer, then we can get a lot of information from the NGS, da NGS data. The just $100 can provide uh, the whole genome information and what was the, what somatomutation uh, was involved in this cancer types of cancer. So we can identify the appropriate target from this NGS data. We can get the information of the EGFR status or HER2 status or novel gene mutation from this data. And furthermore, we can, because of uh, recent advances in the organoid or other types of uh, 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 avatar model generation for each cancer patient, we can try, we can attempt the testing drugs in avatar, in organoid. So we can select the best drug for each patient. So we can perform the personalized cancer, patient, cancer treatment. This is a near future strategy of decision making in cancer treatment. So in these types of the treatment, there is no enough room for the fusion or fusion imaging or PET MRI or PET CT. So let's think about the new paradigm, new diagnostic paradigm is in precision oncology. Previously, the diagnosis was, the organ-based diagnosis was the most important thing in the treatment strategy. For example, if patients uh, have a long nodule then we uh, we get some uh, we notice that this patient has cancer from the biopsy and we diagnose this patient as a lung cancer but in these days the most important information is not just a lung, in, in the lung cancer previously histology based subtyping was important but because many new targeted therapy have developed so a specific molecular diagnosis was much more important. For example, ARC mutation is just 
5% uh, of the lung adenocarcinoma, but it is important because our mutated lung cancer can be treated with crizotinib or other types of ARC inhibitor. And if page, lung cancer patient carries heart mutation, then it just 1% just of lung cancer carries heart mutation, but the treatment of choice of this type of lung cancer is maybe Herceptin. So the molecular information is much more important. So the classification of the cancer are changed to drug target rather than organ-based classification in this precision oncology strategy. So in the precision medicine, uh, patients underwent uh, a lot of the biomarker studies, including genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics, and we can get the key molecules for each individual level. And because of the uh, remarkable success in the uh, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitor, immune immunotherapy, so we can get a lot of, we need a lot of information regarding the tumor microenvironment. And this is patient-wise level because of the heterogeneity in the tumor microenvironment. So we get a lot of information from uh, each cancer patient level, and we use this information for the treatment strategy. So it is very, very individualized level. So as I mentioned before, previously diagnosis just focus on the location of the cancer. For example, lung cancer or ovarian cancer or colon cancer, and it is based on the organ-based classification. But in this situation, the, mo the more important diagnosis is pre precision information, such as BRAF mutated cancer or heart mutated cancer, regardless of the risk of the organ-based classification. This paradigm changed, uh, uh, changed the cl clinical trials. Uh, previously, clinical trials are performed according to the organ-based classification. For example, if a new drug has been developed, then they try the good candidate for the indication. For example, if a new drug has been developed for the heart targeting, then heart mutation was uh, commonly found in the breast cancer. So they they set they installed the, some new they designed a new clinical trial designed for the breast cancer, heart mutated breast cancer. However, these types of the mutated cancer is much more important than the organ-based classification than new clinical de design have been uh, suggested, such as basket trial. Basket trial means the, the diagnosis was based on the uh, molecular targets instead of the organ-based classification. So paradigm is shifted in the cancer treatment from the tumor site to the molecular profile. This is a good example of the basket trial. This is a new drug, larotractinib, which is an NTRK inhibitor. And it is approved in the FDA and KFDA also uh, because of this NEJM published this study. And NTRK gene fusion is very layer genetic mutation. And it is found in the very layer cancer, such as infantile fibrosarcoma or thyroid cancer in very young adult or childhood, and very layer types of the mutation in common cancer, such as colon cancer or lung cancer. So they could not, uh, de could not uh, design the clinical trial for the single types of the cancer. So they collected a lot of types of cancer, and they screened the mutation of the NTRK fusion oncosin. And they collected all these patients and they use NTRK inhibitor. And this shows remarkable treatment effect like this. This was a phase two clinical trial and more than 80% shows a partial remission. So according to this study, FDA uh, rapidly approved this drug after the phase two trial for the cancer patient, cancer patients uh, regardless of the organ types if the cancer carries NTRK fusion on causing. So this is a new types of drug uh, based on the biomarker. This is another types of basket trial for the strategy of the pembrolizumab. Uh, 
which is a immune checkpoint inhibitor. And uh, pembrolizumab was very, uh, according to previous investigator, many investigators found that pembrolizumab response is very good uh, if the tumor mutation is very high. And very high tumor mutation burden is related to the MSI microsatellite instability. So they uh, designed the pembrolizumab study for the cancer which carry, which have microsatellite, in, microsatellite instability. And this MSI type is common in stomach cancer or colon cancer and some types of breast or lung cancer also sometimes shows MSI. So they performed the basket trial for the cancer patients with MSI high, and they found that these types of MSI high type cancer shows very good uh, efficacy with the pembrolizumab uh, uh, regardless of the organ types. So pembrolizumab was approved for the cancer with MSI high regardless of the types of the solid tumor. So these types of two, these two types of the drug and clinical trials are good examples of the paradigm shift in the precision medicine. So recently biomarker driven adaptive clinical trials are very common. And another types of trials, the umbrella trial, uh, which is uh, somewhat different from the basket trial. This is an organ site specific trial, but these trials include a lot of the strategy. They screen the genomics. Uh, they screening. They screen the genomics data of the cancer, and uh, according to these genomic profiles, uh, multiple drug strategies are included in these types of the umbrella trial. For example, uh, this is a long map trial, and this this is a types of umbrella trial. So they. At the screening phase, they found some genomic data, and according to the biomarker, they designed the sub studies. So according to the biomarkers, they they use different types of the drugs on the clinical trials, and they uh, they want to find the success according to the uh, individualized level clinical trial. So. A, in the Princeton medicine strategy, the individualized level treatment are, are be, maybe in the near future will be realized. So it, many omics data can be easily obtained for each, each cancer patient level because the NGS cost may be more, much more decreased in the near future and it will be less than uh, $100 in 10 years. Many investigators expect that. So we use, we can use these types of omics data uh, in the PAD or theranostic principle. But let's think about our imaging study. Actually, in, for the imaging study, we use one size feeder. If we found a long nodule, we just get CT or FDG PAD. We have a lot of tracers in the investigation, but however, in the clinical field, just we use one tracer, FTG. So FTG can provide a lot of uh, some information on metabolism, but we have many, many, uh, many available tracers. However, we just use only FTG path. It is one size fit or principle. It is different from the recent trends in the precision medicine. So we should change our principle according to these big trends in the personal medicine. So let's think about our principle. We are we are start we have started from the biology. We image the NIS expression by radioiodine, and we uh, we visualize some tumor metabolism using FDG path, and we also. Uh, uh, recently, we also visualize some immune profiles using. Uh, uh, some immune radio immuno uh, uh, radio immunoglobulin imaging. So we can get we we maybe in the near future if we can get a lot of information from the genomic or transcriptomic data, then we can decide what is the best imaging modality and what is the best 
uh, diagnostic principle for each patient level. So many things will be changed uh, in the precision medicine trend. So today's lecture will include the redefine the imaging principle in the, uh, by using the omics data because we can get a lot of systemic and biological information. So we can change imaging and theranostic principle according to this omics data. So I will uh, introduce some real examples and uh, real strategies in the near future for integrative analysis of imaging and omics. So, Qualitative analysis of imaging and omics have been investigated uh, uh, for the 10 or uh, uh, 15 years ago. Because we can get cancer omics data, uh, we can collect cancer omics data uh, around 10 years ago. So we, we can design some qualitative analysis for imaging features and cancer omics data. So we generally call it radio genomics. Many studies in radiology and Ukrainian medicine doctors perform this radio genomic analysis. And this radio genomic analysis is very simple. We can get some imaging information from the imaging data, and we also get some mutation profile or gene expression profiles, then we can find some the correlation between the imaging features and mutation or gene expression profiles. That was the third point of the radio genomics. So Around 2014 or 2015, uh, many, uh, many studies performed the radio genomic analysis for CT or MRI or PET. For example, RCC mutation and CT features have been uh, investigated in published in radiology, and GBM molecular profiles and MR features uh, have been investigated and published in Science Translational Medicine. And this was uh, one of the one of the first paper of the radio genomics, uh, which shows the some collation between the genomic profiles and radiomic profiles in the lung cancer and published in Nature Communications. And these types of study is uh, very simple. Uh, from the lung cancer, from the cancer biopsy, we can get expression profiles for RNA or protein or sometimes we can get genomic alterations such as EGFR or HER2 or BRF status by using the whole exome or whole genome sequencing data. And using uh, recent, uh, recent imaging analysis tools, we can get some imaging profiles such as SUV, tumor size, tumor volume, and recently we can get texture features. And this is high dimensional data and this is also high dimensional data because it, this is a radio radiomic profiles. So this high dimensional and high dimensional data can be collated to each other. And this is uh, the example of the correlative analysis. Maybe previous uh, lectures introduced these types of the study. And this is one of my study that non in the non-small cell lung cancer, SUV max was lower in EGFR mutated adenocarcinoma and more metastolic regions and ARC positive ADC. This is uh, uh, the prototype of radiogenomic analysis. But SUV max cannot be used as a predictor of EGFR mutation, uh, even though they show some uh, 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 a uh, uh, good performance in the AUC, but it's not uh, it's not enough good for the diagnosis of EGFR mutation. And furthermore, EGFR the diagnosis of EGFR mutation is cheaper than FDG PET. So let's think about the clinical meaning of a previous radio genomic studies. Uh, one of the examples shows that low SUV was associated with the EGFR mutation but we cannot predict the response to EGFR mutated targeted drug because it, the, the accuracy of the EGFR mutation prediction is very low. So we cannot use, we cannot uh, change the clinical, uh, clinical strategy for the EGFR mutation testing by using the FDG path. So the predictive value is very, very low. 
And we did not decide the treatment uh, strategy according to the SCV max. By using the SCV max, we uh, the SCV max can be correlated with a lot of the molecular profiles or a lot of the gene expressions. However, with this information, we cannot change the treatment decision. So actually, radio genomics are very, 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 very. Uh, uh, sometimes we 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 think that radio genomics is very good. However, the uh, in the real situation, the clinical meaning is very low. And there are a lot of limitations and challenges in the radio genomic analysis, current radio genomic analysis. The one of the problem is large P and small M problem. And another is causality. And another problem is difference in scale. Let's think about this each, uh, each factor. Large P and small M problem is related to the statistical problem. Large P means a lot of dimensional, high dimensional data. Radiome feature has, uh, we can get more than 100 of radiome feature. And from the genomic or transcriptomic data, we can get the profiles of gene expression profile more than one, uh, 10,000 of gene expression profile. So there is too many information from this data. However, uh, the data uh, acquired from the patients are barely limited. For example, this is one of the first paper of the radio genomics in nuclear medicine fields. And they collected some gene expression data from the 26 patients. And also they collected past CT data from these 26 patients. And they collected image features from the radiomic analysis, more than 150. And they collected gene expression values more than two, uh, 20,000 20, of the gene expression level. They analyzed the correlation between these image features and these genes from these 26 patients. And in the statistics, uh, this generates some first, many first positive. So the radio genomic profiles, they suggest that predict the air bronchogram by some set of the genes. And they also suggest that predict the size of the tumor using some set of the genes. However, this cannot be reproduced in other cohort because of large P and small M problem. This can generate some first positive. So because of this problem, uh, many uh, uh, investigators suggest the uh, problems of reproducibility. So from, uh, in these groups in China used previous a landmark paper, radio genomic paper, this nature communication paper, and they reanalyzed these types of study. And they found that the, the problems in the reproducibility, because CT or PET imaging textures can be changed according to the, uh, uh, the reconstruction of the imaging or the acquisition parameters of the imaging. So these types of the texture features can be changed even if they acquire the same patient. So this changes the radio, radio profiles and they are suggested um, uh, some predicted prediction model cannot be working if the uh, reconstruction parameters are changing. So reproducibility in prediction model is a severe problem and radiome feature is not reproducible and even more, segmentation of the long nodule is not reproducible because of the reconstruction or uh, imaging acquisition methods. So they suggest that these types of radiogenomic analysis have problems in reproducibility. And another problem is causality. Many radiogenomic analysts are underwriting the collective analysis, such as Pearson or Spearman correlation. But this correlation uh, did not mean the causality. For example, chaos over expression is related to the air bronchogram, according to the radio genomic analysis. But it is, there is no causality. Chaos over expression 
cannot generate the air bronchogram pattern in the city. And also in vice versa, air bronchogram uh, cannot explain the KRAS over expression. This is just uh, two types of uh, causal causality have been just associated with by another factor, maybe. So we cannot explain the causality by the uh, collective analysis in the radio genomics, radio genomics. And another problem is difference in scale. Actually, uh, we get some transcriptomic or genome profiles in the cancer from the very small sized biopsy tissue. For example, this is a cancer tissue. And actually, we get some uh, gene expression profiles or gen uh, gen genomic alterations data acquired from the very small tissue, biopsy tissue. However, in the imaging profiles, we uh, acquired the imaging profiles from the whole tumor level. And the, uh, uh, the, tum uh, the biopsy, the, according to the small patches of the biopsy site, the genomic profiles can be largely changing. This is an example of the difference in scale. Uh, this is a, a single tumor and the PDR1 expression, which is the important biomarker for the immune checkpoint inhibitor. And this PDR1 expression is changed according to the biopsy site. For example, at this site, PDR1 is negative. However, in this site of the tumor, different site of tumor, it shows uh, uh, positive in the PDR1 expression. So, but we, however, our imaging study, uh, uh, the imaging profiles are acquired from this whole tumor level. So it will be changed according to the tumor biopsy site. The result may be changed according to the tumor biopsy site. So difference in scale is uh, uh, problems in the collective analysis. But recently many uh, situations are changed because of the techno advances in technology. Uh, recent trends in the genomic data analysis are changed to the single cell level. So we can get large data sets. Single cell level analysis means uh, we get genomic or transcriptomic information at the single cell level. So if we get the tumors and we in the tumors biopsy site, we can collect more than uh, 10,000 of cells and we get uh, transcriptomic or genomic profiles of these types of the all types of the cells. So the large P and large N problems, uh, it is the situation is changed to large P and large N problems. And causality it can be uh, analyzed by biological perturbation. For example, in the animal model, we can treat some drugs, some molecular target drugs, and we can uh, acquire the profiles of the genomic profiles. And we can also acquire the imaging data so we can correlate these uh, longitudinal changes of data, then we can solve this causality problem. And previously, difference in scale is, was a big problem, but they sent new technology, inside technology, uh, uh, by the inside technology, we get some genomic or transcriptomic profiles at the uh, inside level, at the single cell resolution. So, by using these types of the insight technology, then we can uh, 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 we can uh, correlate with imaging directly. So these types of study can change the uh, new 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 types of study can be uh, performed in this new insight technology in the radio genomic analysis. So the genome genomic or transcriptomic data. Uh, acquisition is rapidly grown. So previously, we used our, our real-time PCR to get one gene in the bulk tissue, but in uh, by the technology advance, a few genes and cells, the information can be acquired. But after uh, the technology development, microarray can provide the expression profiles of many genes. And after the NGS technology, uh, the transcriptome profiles can be acquired from the tissue. And in around 2011, uh, at the single cell level, transcriptome data can be acquired. 
and recently because of the rapid growth uh, fields of the single cell level analysis, more sense and more genes can be, uh, the information can be acquired from the single cell level analysis and it is commercialized by many, many startups and many uh, biotechno tec biotechnology companies. And recently this single cell level analysis are changed to insight to technology, as I mentioned before. So it shows some gene expression data uh, at the insight level at the cellular resolution and it, it can be it can be registered with our imaging technology to analyze the uh, genomic profiles associated with uh, our imaging analysis. So before the uh, introduction of uh, some recent collative analysis of imaging and omics, we should know the brief overview of the single cell and RNA-seq technology. RNA-seq is uh, the technology of NGS-based technology to, uh, to, uh, to, to know the uh, expression level of the RNA. RNA is a transcript and RNA sequencing is a transcriptome data. It can provide transcription data. So, if we get some tumor tissues or other biological samples, then we can extract RNA, mRNA. And because RNA is not stable, so we can change this mRNA to cDNA by reverse transcriptase. And, and recent NGS technique technologies can uh, measure the cDNA level by using the sequence fragments. And we uh, we aligned these types of fragments on the already known genes, then we can count the cDNA levels for each gene. By using this count, we can measure the expression level of each gene and each mRNA. So this is a principle of RNA-seq. So RNA-seq provides some expression data of the all of the gene. So it is regarded as a transcriptome. But uh, recent technology, single cell level analysis changes this tissue from tissue to single cell level by using the barcodes on each single cell using the nanotechnology. Uh, we can get some gene expression, gene count information for each cell level. And so each cell have information of the gene expression more than uh, ten thousand of the gene expression level. So we can uh, measure the similarity between these types of cells. So we can cluster these types of cells in the tumor tissue or other types of the uh, bio sample. So previous RNA-seq analysis shows whole gene expression level in the whole tissue. However, single cell analysis uh, changes this analysis to the single cell level, uh, which consists of this work tissue. So this analysis can change the recent uh, biological analysis uh, because we can get a, a lot of information of the cell types and heterogeneous cell, cells in the uh, biological samples such as cancer or tumor tissue. So you can get the tissue, you can get the tissue and isolate the individual cells and we, uh, the, uh, we can get the cDNA and perform the NGS techniques for the uh, gene expression level, count the gene expression level, and compare the gene expression profiles at the single cell level, and we can find some similar cells according to these types of gene expression data. And we can collect the read counts and by using some uh, bioinformatic analysis, uh, we can uh, find some uh, different types, uh, the, uh, the fraction of the different types of cells in the tumor tissue were very specific or layer cell types in the tumor or other biological sample. So, and as I mentioned before, recent trends are changes to the insight technology. Be uh, previous single cell level analysis provides some gene expression profiles at the cellular level. However, they lost lose their, uh, their location information. But spatial, spatial technology, spatially reserved 
transcriptome data provides some insight technology, uh, which shows some gene expression profiles and multidimensional gene expression profiles in, in, in situ. So it can provide some pseudo image like our, our uh, well-known images like that. So each color means different types of cells according to the gene expression profiles, and they can provide, by insight technology, they can provide uh, cell types in insight too. So uh, previous Berkseek is like a, a fruit juice and single cell omics is the, uh, the, the analysis of ingredient and spatial omics means uh, these types of the uh, anatomical or structural organization of the cells. So these types of spatial omics can be integrated with our imaging analytical technology, and it can provide some uh, new targets for the diagnostic or imaging agent. So um, in this, by using this single cell molecular information can be combined with our uh, autoradiography or PET imaging technology. And by using this information, we can uh, understand underlying biology of the specific imaging. And using this, a lot of molecular information, we can translate to the molecular imaging. For example, if we want to know uh, what is the best target targeting this area, thermos, then we can information of a lot of genomic profiles specifically targeting the thermos, then we can suggest these types of the target can be a new molecular imaging targets. And we can use this information for the development of new imaging or new theranostic drugs. So we can use this new information for the collative analysis. So as a next to topic, I will show some uh, real examples of integrative analysis of imaging and omics. So as I mentioned before, previous radio genomic analysis just shows a simple correlation. However, if we, if we, uh, if we find some biological or clinical application, uh, we can get very uh, insightful information from the correlation analysis or sometimes uh, some uh, recent genomic data provides some new insight for the molecular imaging or theranostics. So I will show some examples of integrative analysis of imaging and omics. So first one is rediscovery of our routine imaging. Let's think about the underlying biology of the FDG uptake. Uh, here is the FDG uptake imaging. Maybe uh, you can imagine the diagnosis of this image. Maybe your expected diagnosis may be lung cancer. However, actually this patient was tuberculosis. So FTG uptake is actually non-specific. Let's think about the cancer imaging, FTG pad imaging for the cancer. Next question is, are there only cancer cells in the tumor? Actually, no. There in the tumor, uh, cancer cells are uh, cancer cells are surrounded by many tumor microenvironment cells. For example, cancer-associated fibroblast or extracellular matrix and many lymphocytes or monocytes or uh, macrophages are are mixed in the tumor microenvironment. So the next question is: tumor hypermetabolism means we are cancer cell uptake in the FDG pad. In the leading, uh, in our leading, we uh, usually uh, report that the patient shows hypermetabolic tumor in uh, liver or in spleen or in brain. However, hypermetabolism did not always mean the cancer cell uptake. Actually, we don't know because of we just show we just we just uh, read our image at the gross level not the microscopic level. So we should know the biological mechanism of the FDG uptake in the systemic level. So the basic principle of FDG uptake is glucose uptake by glucose transporter and uh, accumulation by the glycolysis. 
So hypermetabolism at the growth level is associated with the cellular glucose transporter. And also it is correlated with cellular glycolysis, especially hexokinase activity. And because hypercellularity is, can be associated with hypermetabolism at the growth scale, and also tissue perfusion also affect the K1 in the kinetic analysis. So it also affect the hypermetabolism at the growth scale of these PET images. So FDG uptake is uh, associated with many biological factors, such as aggressiveness of the cancer cells. Okay and vasculature and perfusion of the cancer cells and inflammation of the cancer cells and necrosis or apoptosis of the, of the tumors. So my previous question was what, cause, what causes variable FDG uptake according to the systemic analysis because many factors affect the FDG uptake. So to solve this type of problem, I used the radiogenomic analysis. But as I mentioned before, the radiogenomic analysis are suffered from large P and small M problem because we need we we already get a lot of the genes, more than 10,000 of genes, and just in the limited number of the patients. So I used a, a, some different methods, such as WGCNA. It means weighted gene correlation network analysis. But actually, it's not important, but I just use some gene modules. By using the gene expression data, I selected some specific modules to reduce the gene, uh, reduce the numbers of the features, tumor features. So in this analysis, I used head and neck cancer carcinoma uh, data matched with the FDG path, and I collected the gene network modules, and I found that a specific gene module among the nine gene modules was correlated with the FDG path. And these types of the module was associated with the uh, inflammation in the tumor microenvironment. It, these this, uh, small dots means each gene, and these genes are correlated to each other. And this gene module was associated with the regulation of cell activation and regulation of leukocyte activation and leukocyte cell to cell, cell, to cell audition. So these types of the genes are associated with the inflammation. And this mod, the module was negatively correlated with FDG uptake, according to our, my study. So at the time, I discussed this finding with the metabolic competition. This is a uh, or uh, somewhat new, 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 uh, new hypothesis of the tumor microenvironment. Uh, in the tumor microenvironment, cancer cells and, and immune cells are, have some competition in the nutri nutrition and metabolism. And one of the immune suppression mechanism of the cancer cells are metabolic competition. It's a very easy concept. If cancers are progressed, then cancer cell needs a lot of nutrients. So cancer cell shows hypermetabolism. But many immune cells, such as effector cells, NT cells or effector T cells, or some activated macrophages, needs aerobic glycolysis. So these effector cells and cancer cells are comparative in nutrient. But after the cancer progression, they suppress these types of the effector cells and they change the tumor microenvironment to the immune suppressive cells. And these types, these types of the metabolic competition have been proven by some in vitro studies and some preclinical studies and published in cell. So I used this concept to explain the negative correlation between the immune-related immune gene activation and the decreased FDG uptake, negative correlation between the immune cell activation and FDG uptake. So I used this concept to other types of cancer and in the lung adenocarcinoma, it was not simply negatively correlated with uh, FDG, uh, it, FDG uptake was not simply correlated with the immune cell activation, but they were, they was not simply correlated. However, uh, they show some uh, 
FDG uptake was collated with some specific cluster. For example, some tumor metabolism was high in specific cluster, which ha has a lot of regulatory T cells. And a specific cluster shows very low tumor metabolism, and it shows a high expression of master cells and central memory CD4 T cells. So tumor microenvironment was different according to the tumor glucose metabolism. So I suggest some new, uh, new types of the long adenocarcinoma clusters according to the immune cells and glucose metabolism. So hypermetabolic tumors have very low regulatory T cells, uh, very high regulatory T cells, and they show very poor prognosis. And another types of the cancer shows low metabolism and enriched muscle cells and specific types of the T cells, and they show good prognosis. And this another two types of the tumor shows uh, moderate glucose metabolism, but shows different types of the immune cells and a specific immune types of the uh, tumor microenvironment shows high CD8 T cells and M1 macrophages, and they are hyperinflammatory tumors and they show good prognosis. And another type shows immune desert type, which shows very low uh, immune cells in the tumor microenvironment, and it was it shows very poor prognosis. So I suggest new uh, subtypes of the lung adenocarcinoma according to the glucose metabolism and immune cells. So I also uh, analyzed the underlying biology of FDG uptake in different types of cancer for the lung squamous cell carcinoma. And I found that as uh, uh, similar with the head and neck cancer, uh, I found that immune score means the immune enrichment in the tumor microenvironment was negatively correlated with glucose transporter one and glycolysis. However, interestingly, I found that some positive correlation between the immune score and glucose transporter three. So, it was very interesting finding because I expect that immune score may be negatively correlated with glucose transporter. However, glucose transporter show, three shows positive correlation. So my hypothesis was that in the tumor microenvironment, glucose transporter three uh, can be uh, highly expressed in the other types of the immune cells rather than the cancer cells. So I used a single cell RNA sequencing analysis from uh, other public data, and I found 21 cellular clusters from the lung cancer patient in the tumor microenvironment. This means cancer cells by some tumor markers, and here is a T cells and macrophages clusters. And I found that glucose transporter one is highly expressed in the cancer cell cluster in here and here. And however, glucose transporter three was highly expressed in the immune cells, more specifically in the myeloid cells and T cells. So glucose transporter is differently expressed in the tumor microenvironment in lung squamous cell carcinoma. And I found some, uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want to analyze some these types of glucose transporter and FDG uptake. By using the analysis, uh, the FDG uptake was measured by SUV and normalized by liver, liver SUV. And the immune enriched score, immune score was negatively correlated with the FDG at first. And after the high immune tumor shows positive correlation. And in the immune poor tumors, relatively immune poor tumors shows glucose uptake in the FDG path was positively correlated with GLUT1. And in the immune list tumor, the FDG uptake was positively correlated with glucose transporter three. So my hypothesis was FDG uptake was correlated with glucose transporter one and glucose transporter three. And in the immune poor tumor, glucose uptake, FDG uptake depends on the glucose transporter one uh, expressed in the cancer cells. And if tumors are uh, uh, very enriched immune cells, then glucose uptake depends on the glucose transfer, transporter three, uh, which is highly expressed in the immune cells. So according to uh, my research, by studies, 
Uh, actually, we, uh, we just see the FTG avidity and high uptake in it at the tumor level, gross level. However, in the micro scale tumor biology, FTG uptake can be mediated by cancer cells as well as the immune cells, uh, which highly express the glucose transfer, transporter three. So, by using the uh, these types of the genomic and transcriptomic analysis, we can understand the biology of the tumor uh, trace, tracer uptake or tracer, tracer accumulation. So, uh, before the moving to the next topic, we think about our uh, our common sense. Do you know the how much immune cells in tumor tissue? Actually, it is just around five to twenty percent. Actually, immune rich tumor just uh, the proportion of immune cells just to uh, twenty percent. But actually, according to my le my leisure, immune score high immune rich tumors depends on the glucose transfer three. Just to uh, just 10 or 20 percent of immune cells uh, maybe uh, cannot reflect the old, old types of the tumor. But the next question is, is does glutes have different glucose affinity? Actually, glucose transfer 3 has much uh, more glucose, trans uh, glucose affinity than glucose transfer 1. So we can explain these types of the study because glucose transfer 3 uh, can more accumulate the FTC. So uh, even though the immune cells, uh, even the proportion of immune cells just 10 or 20%, but glucose transporter three shows uh, high ability with the FDG. So it can play a critical role in the FDG accumulation in the uh, immune cells in the tumor microenvironment. And actually, this glucose 3 enrichment in tumor microenvironment is commonly found in many solid tumors. And these types of the study can be uh, used in the future to uh, know the tumor microenvironment status by using the FDG PET. So I suggest that glucose transporter 3 reflects the immune cell activation or immune cell enrichment. So glucose transporter transporter 3 and glucose transporter 1 ratio can be used as a predictive biomarker for the immune status. So I collected the melanoma, pa melanoma patient cohort uh, who treated with anti-PD-1. And I found that uh, this glucose transporter 3 and glucose transporter 1 ratio, GLUT1 3 to GLUT1 ratio, can be a surrogate of metabolic competition. So glucose, uh, this ratio was higher in the treatment list ponders, particularly in the own treatment data. So these types of study is a new biomarker reflect the uh, tumor metabolic status. So actually in the clinical fields, we actually uh, meet this situation. Using the anti-PD-1 or anti-PDR1, there are some, uh, some cases show pseudo progression. Pseudo progression means after the treatment of the immune checkpoint inhibitor, uh, the, the tumor size or tumor metabolism is increased and then the decreased, remarkably decreased after the progression. It is a typical, it is a, uh, it is a specific uh, interesting finding of the immune checkpoint inhibitor and it, it, it may be related to the glucose transfer three. Maybe it is my hypothesis because increased GLUT3 enrich the immune cells after the immune checkpoint blockade, then the tumor uh, microenvironment increased the uptake of the FDG. So it, uh, it, 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 cause, it causes pseudo progression. So this is a summary of underlying FDG biology for the cancer. Actually, we overlooked the FDG uptake in the immune cells and different enrichment of glucose transporters in tumor microenvironment, and they play a role in the FDG uptake. And by using this biology, we can uh, imagine the metabolism-based biomarker. Uh, and it, it, it may be uh, new information of the FDG path. And 
I briefly, another study is introduced by uh, this collective analysis uh, using the PET and omics data. This is an example of the PSMA. Actually, PSMA is overexpressed in many prostate cancer. However, in the progression of the biological progression of prostate cancer are uh, changes to uh, the, some neural endocrine differentiation and PSMA is decreased. And according to this uh, transcriptomic analysis, PSMA and uh, some neural endocrine differentiation markers are negatively correlated. It means if PSMA negative uh, neuro, uh, PSMA negative prostate cancer, we uh, can use sometimes Dota talk or Dota Tate to visualize the tumors, or sometimes we can uh, we can use these types of the tracers for the theranostics for the PSMA negative tumor. This is a, a underlying biology of the prostate cancer uh, for the uh, theranostics. And this is another example of the biology of the choline. Actually, F18 or C11 choline is used in the prostate cancer, and sometimes it can use in the HCC or a parathyroid tumors. And this study uh, finds some underlying biology of the choline uptake in the HCC. And they found that according to the correlative analysis, they found that the beta cutanin activity increase the choline uptake. And beta cutanin activity is uh, related to the gain of function mutation of the HCC, and it is also a prognostic factor. So they found that some choline uptake related genes are also related to the key mutation profiles of the HCC. So choline pad can characterize the HCC uh, for the uh, specific uh, prognostic markers of beta cutanin activity. So these types of study can provide some underlying biology of the uh, uh, non-invasive imaging. Okay, this is an example of the collective analysis between the PAD and uh, some RNA-seq or other genomic data. And do you have any questions? Okay, if you don't have any questions, then uh, take a last for 10 minutes and I will start the second part after 10 minutes. Before starting, I would like to inform that if you, uh, we would like to uh, ask you a favor to fill out the questionnaires that we have uh, put a link in the chat. So uh, just before or after the lecture, please fill out the questionnaire. And if you have any questions or comments in between the lecture, please uh, uh, give us some comments or questions in the chat. Thank you. Okay, I'll move on to the next topic. Okay, so I also, I additionally introduced um, the new examples of the integrative analysis of imaging and omics uh, in terms of the biomarker for the diagnostics and theranostics. So I will deal with some perspectives of the uh, theranostics or precision imaging in the precision oncology strategy. So I, as I mentioned before, we use one size fit all principle in the tumor imaging. We just only use FDG path except some prostate cancer or neuroendocrine tumor, but we always use FDG path for the staging as a nuclear medicine modality. However, there are a lot of tracers in investigation and because we can get as some biological or molecular information by the NGS technology. So we can use different types of tracers according to the rediscovery of the biology at the individual cancer level. So 
we can perform the precision targeting using the different types of the radio tracers. There are a lot of clinically available radio tracers. For example, FDG and uh, uh, sodium fluoride and F-DOPA. And these types of the tracers are clinically available and approved in the Korean FDA. And another tracers such as acetate, methionine, f and dotatoc or dotatate or f or fluorocorine or FES are all these types of tracers are clinically available. And other tracers such as RGD or some TSPO or Manos, uh, Arbumin, uh, these types of tracers can uh, characterize the tumor microenvironment as a research purpose. So we can imagine the current status of the imaging strategy for the metastatic pheochromocytoma or metastatic prostate cancer. Actually, we uh, have some a few available radio tracers more than FDZ. For example, for the metastatic pheochromocytoma, we actually we have some controversy in the first of choice for the imaging. Iodine 123 MIBZ are available, is available, and dotatoc avidity is found in many metastatic pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. And F dopa path is also suggested for the metastatic pheochromocytoma. And classically, we can use FDG path for the staining or disease monitoring or to, uh, response evaluation. Then we should choose the uh, uh, the first choice of the uh, imaging for the metastatic pheochromocytoma. So recently, European Journal of Nuclear Medicine suggests um, a guideline for the imaging modality of the metastatic pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. So if we have a lot of available radio tracers, then we should choose appropriate imaging agent according to the tumor types or according to the tumor molecular subtypes. And under example is metastatic prostate cancer. Around two or three years ago, there have been a lot of studies for the comparison, head to head comparison for the PSMA path and choline path. And these types of study is uh, the, the, the studies for the, for the choosing the best tracers for characterize of prostate cancer. So we can use PSMA and choline and FACBC and FDZ, and for the neural endocrine differentiation, we can choose Dota Talk. And actually, in the head to head comparison, PSMA path shows better performance than F8 in choline. However, it is not one size feeder. Some types of the uh, prostate cancer shows low PSMA ability and high choline uptake. So these two tracers, or more than three tracers, uh, have different role in the visualization of the prostate cancer. So we should choose appropriate tracers for the staging or disease monitoring of the metastatic prostate cancer. And this situation will be increased in our nuclear medicine fields. So let's think about the atlas of the tumor characterization. I use the TCG data to analyze the pan-cancer atlas of tumor metabolism because Many cancers shows hyperglucose metabolism, but some types of the cancer shows very low glucose metabolism. For example, some types of diffuse types of stomach cancer is uh, one of the good example of first negative cancer for the uh, FDG path. So I wonder why there, why there are many types of the tumors shows FDG non-ability. So I analyzed the atlas of the tumor metabolism and I found that uh, each tumor have heterogeneous tumor metabolism even in the same tumor types. So by analyzing and by uh, investigation of the tumor metabolism profiles, then we can, uh, these types of the atlas can provide some insights for the personalized imaging approaches. By using the metabolic signatures from the genomic or transcriptomic data, uh, we can analyze the glucose or uh, fatty acid or amino acid metabolism at the individual tumor level. So, for example, if patients 
underwent the tumor biopsy and by the NGS technique, technology provides some information of the tumor metabolism and it shows the enhanced glycolysis and we can choose alpha 18 fd path. And if the tumors enhance the fatty acid metabolism, then we can choose C11 acetic. And if tumors in shows enhance the amino acid metabolism, then we can choose C11 methionine or F18 aftopop. So we can choose appropriate imaging strategy for each cancer types at the individual tumor level. So previously, FTG or other types of radio tracer based path was cheaper than the NGS technology. However, NGS technology is cheaper than FTG path in the near future. So these types of strategy will be realized. And let's think about the diagnostics. Actually, peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, uh, such as lutetium dotatate, uh, Lutathera uh, has been approved in the FDA and Korean FDA also, and it is actively performed in our center. And uh, lutetium dotatate and gallium dotatop or gallium dotatate have roles in the companion diagnostics and therapies. And actually, it is approved in the GEP, gastroenterotero and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. However, actually somatostatin receptor 2 high expression is very common. So we can imagine the basket trial for the radionuclide therapy. A somatostatin receptor 2 type 2 is highly expressed in the neuroendocrine tumor, particularly mid gut NET. However, neuroendocrine differentiation is found in other types of cancer. For example, for the prostate cancer, also shows neuroendocrine differentiation and includes the somatostatin receptor 2, uh, even though some just a few proportion of prostate cancer express the somatostatin receptor 2. But we have some we have companion diagnostics to know the rotation dotate distribution. We can uh, we can uh, predict the distribution of rotation dotate by using the gallium dotato path. So with the companion diagnostics using gallium dota talk, then we can select the patient uh, regardless of the organ site, tumor or tumor origin site. So I analyzed the somatostatin receptor 2 expression levels in the pan cancer or types of the cancer. And I found that uh, low grade glioma and breast cancer shows high expression of the somatostatin receptor 2. For example, breast cancer, more than 15% of breast cancer shows higher expression of the somatostatin receptor 2 than the paraganglioma. It means uh, some types of the breast cancer can be a good candidate for the gallium uh, lutetium dotatate therapy. So some investigator also performs some uh, gallium dotatop and lutetium dotatate therapy in uh, other than the neuroendocrine tumor, mid gut neuroendocrine tumor. So actually, gallium dota uptake is highly, uh, uh, is very visualized, the pituitary adenoma and meningioma, and some types of the renal cell carcinoma and uh, PNET. So many, many types of the tumors can show a high dota or dota tate avidity. And also by using this. Gallium dota talk as a companion diagnostics and this information of high expression of the somatostatin type receptor type 2. Some researchers by the investigator initiated trial, they performed some uh, yttrium 90 dota talk treatment for the meningioma. And they showed that a uh, very good result for the treatment response for the meningioma, uh, malignant meningioma. And another good target. Pan cancer target is a FAPI. And as maybe many people already know that FAPI PAD uh, has, show, ha, has shown a remarkable performance in the uh, tumor imaging. Mm -hmm. And it, it was the image of the year in two years ago. And it is actively studied as a new imaging agent and as a new theranostic target. Because a FA, FAP is uh, FAP is a specifically bound to the FAP, which is a molecule, surface molecule, 
uh, highly expressed in the cancer-associated fibroblast. And cancer-associated fibroblast is initiated in the tumor, even in the very small size of tumor, micrometer size of tumor, also express the cancer-associated fibroblast. So many investigators expect that FAP could be a good target for the treatment of microscopic tumors if we can label the rotation and if we uh, can get some good uh, probes which has very long circulation time. But actually for the imaging agent, it has or uh, it is expected to a big success because it can visualize many types of the tumors and it has some uh, lower compared with the FDG pack. And actually FAP is highly expressed in the all types of solid tumors. And if we have some new uh, theranostic agent targeting the FAP, FAP fiber associated protein, then uh, we can choose appropriate types of the cancer uh, using these types of the analysis. So actually this, uh, this new study design, uh, which shows high ability of the FAP agent have been started and some prototype designed drugs such as lutetium FAP2286 uh, developed by Clovis Oncology have been uh, underwent in the IND submitted and I heard that it is ongoing clinical trial as a phase one and it will uh, be applied to many types of the solid tumors including breast cancer, untreatable breast cancer or untreatable lung cancer or untreatable HSCC. So uh, using this uh, molecular profiling and we can choose imaging related markers and we can perform the precision imaging. For example, if, we, if the tumor, individualized tumor shows a high expression of the PSMA, then we can choose PSMA path. And by using this precision imaging strategy, we also suggest some pre precision theranostic uh, therapy. So if the tumor shows high ability in the uh, TOGOR dotatate, then we can suggest dotatate therapy will be the best uh, theranostic strategy. And if the tumor shows high expression of PSMA and PSMA pet shows high ability, then we can choose PSMA therapy as a first of choice for the theranostics. So imaging can be uh, trans related to omics and omics can be translated to imaging to decide the appropriate theranostic target. So if it, we need biopsy tissue to diagnose the cancer, and we also from this biopsy, we can analyze the many metabolic profiles and marker expression and the, by the proteomic or uh, transcriptomic analysis. And we can choose appropriate imaging and appropriate therapy strategy. So as I mentioned before, these types of, some types of the tumors already should determine this uh, multiple choice problem. For example, pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, we have a lot of strategy imaging and theranostic strategy. For the imaging, we can choose aftopa or MIBZ or somatostatin analog or FDG. And for treatment, we should choose either 131 MIBC or rotation dotatate. So in the EJN and guideline, they, they suggest that the first choice of the imaging agent according to the molecular profiles. For example, for the sporadic pheochromocytoma, the first choice is aftopa or MIBC. But inherited pheochromocytoma except SDH mutation, and other mutations, including NF1 or LED or VHL or MAX mutation, then the first choice is aftopa. However, SDH mutation carrier for uh, the pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma is, is well visualized by uh, garium dotatog or garium dotatate. So the first choice is garium based somatostatin analog. So by using the molecular profiles, we can choose appropriate imaging agent in the pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. And as I mentioned before, we will meet this situation in other types of the cancer, such as prostate cancer, 
and in the future, other types of cancer such as breast tube or stomach or colon or lung cancer. So, in the diagnostic or imaging principle, precision oncology already uh, changed our imaging or diagnostic strategy. So, let's think about the clinical integration of the new and new target development using the new genomic or transcriptomic data. Another example, another example of the integration of data is the precision diagnostics. Actually, uh, previously, uh, a research group developed some net score, which is a gene expression-based clusters. They collected blood samples from the patient with neuroendocrine tumor, and they found that some specific gene expression was high, highly expressed in the blood as well as the tumor tissues. And they collected these genes, and they gener generate some. They develop some new score system, net score, uh, which is a blood-based biomarker. And they suggest that it can reflect the tumor burden. So in the after the theranostics uh, uh, rotation-based dotatase therapy are activated, then these types of the blood-based biomarker also increased. So this net test, net support test have been, uh, have been tried in the real case of the PRRT. And Recent paper published in EJNM, they shows that this gene expression-based biomarker can divide the responders and non-responders very well. So using this bio broad-based biomarker, we can determine the treatment strategy of rotation dotatase therapy. If patient shows good response after one or two cycles of the uh, dotatase therapy, you, using this blood biomarker, then we can choose the treatment strategy adaptive by this biomarker. And by combining the information of the dosimetry and gallium dotato ability and FDG ability and this blood-based biomarker, we can change the dose or strategy of the rotation dotate therapy. And after the four cycles of the rotation dotate therapy, we using this type of blood-based biomarker can uh, some provide some information or provide some evidence that this patient whether uh, further rotation dotate therapy can be helpful or not. So the integration of data is maybe more become more important because radio the market size of the radio theranostics is remarkably increased. So these types of the blood-based biomarker or tissue-based biomarker may be another important problem to, the, to become a success of radiotheranostics. And we are in here, and actually FDA approved current concept of the uh, radiotheranostics is just to rotation dotate. However, one or two years later, FDA and maybe KFDA approved the PSMA therapy and other types of the radiotheranostic agent will be approved in the uh, Europe and US and Korea in the near future. So it changed the many types of the uh, oncology treatment strategy. So let's think about the discovery of the next target for the theranostics. Carium and rotation-based dotatate therapy have been succeed and PSMA will be will be su succeed in the near future. And the problem is the discovery of the next target for the success of the theranostic principle. And theranostics is uh, one of the drug discovery platforms. And actually, it has some advantages compared with other types of drug discovery platforms, such as antibody-based treatment or ADC antibody drug conjugate or recent concept of some protease-based uh, drug discovery platform. However, the theranostics, the advantage of theranostics is the fact that binding is the most important thing because our radiotheranostic agent has negligible pharmacologic effect. So we should not, uh, we, we, we should not consider the toxic effect of the drug itself. And another, another 
advantages of the diagnostic agent is a molecular level tar target, and we can obtain some whole body level distribution by using the companion diagnostics as a path or stack imaging. So the bottle that of the diagnostics is to find the appropriate biological target and appropriate molecule. So uh, recent technology such as single cell analysis can provide some new uh, target and the biological, new biological target and appropriate biological target can be, uh, uh, can facilitate the new theranostic agent. So this is an example of the suggestion of new theranostic agent uh, using the single cell RNA sequencing data analysis using the COVID-19 patient. I collected some COVID-19 birth fluid uh, patient, uh, cells from the COVID-19 birth fluid as a publicly available data. And I found that some specific myeloid cells were increased in severe COVID-19 patients. And actually severe COVID-19 is associated with the macrophage hyperinflammation syndrome. So these types of the macrophages can be a cause of the hyperinflammation and cause of the severe symptoms of COVID-19. So I want to find some appropriate target of these types of the macrophages, alveolar macrophages or monocyte derived macrophages. So this M01 and M03 is a specific macrophages found in the severe COVID-19 compared with the moderate uh, COVID-19 patients. So I found some uh, two different strategies. First one is uh, the comparison of the already known imaging targets. For example, glucose transporter is a target of FDC and MCT is a target of acetate and folate receptor is a target of folate. So I, uh, I tested this type in silico tested test. I performed the in silico test for this molecular distribution in this uh, immune cells in the COVID-19 patient. And I found that GLU3 was highly expressed in the severe COVID-19 associated with macrophages. So FDG could be used to uh, stratify the severe COVID-19 according to this in silico analysis. And furthermore, I found some markers specifically uh, specific for these types of the severe COVID-19 macrophages. And this is a, a severe COVID-19 associated with macrophages and they show some high expression of specific targets. And by using the surface markers database and target peptide database, I found the three were two appropriate targets with the uh, uh, peptide probes. And a suggested imaging and surface target candidate was FPR1, uh, which is specifically uh, highly expressed in neutrophils and some types of macrophages and it can be targeted by these peptides. So I suggest this new uh, uh, diagnostic or theranostic uh, target probes, uh, which target the severe COVID-19 for the imaging and for the therapy, specifically drug delivery system uh, for the targeting severe COVID-19. So these types of in silico analysis can suggest a new target for the new theranostic agent. And these types of analysis can be performed in many types of cancer or some other inflammation or other neurodegenerative disorders. So I introduced some uh, integrative analysis of omics and nuclear medicine. Actually, previous studies just focused on the correlation, molecular correlation between the genomic data and radiomic data. However, they have no clinical implication because uh, the predictive value is very low and many statistical problems. However, if we focus on the underlying biology, then we can have some uh, insight to a new application of the PET imaging. For example, for FDG uptake can be mediated by the tumor immune microenvironment. So we can use FDG PET to characterize the tumor immune microenvironment status. So we can find some underlying functional biology for of the radio tracers. And also 
recently uh, precision on policy based on the NGS based strategy have been uh, performed in many clinical fields. So we can choose, we can use these types of principle. For example, if we can get many molecular information from the tumor biopsy or tum uh, blood from the tumor patient, then we can choose appropriate imaging or therapy strategy, more particularly therapeutic strategies. And using this uh, new molecular information and high dimensional molecular information, we can uh, suggest the new targets for the new theranostic uh, drugs as a drug discovery platform. So in the core principle of the nuclear medicine is a theranostics. And actually theranostics and nuclear medicine itself is a precision medicine. And because we started from the biology to visualize the tumors or visualize the disease status, and we, uh, we use this principle recently to the therapy. For example, peptide receptor radio nuclear therapy. But recent trends in the NGS-based precision oncology, we can use these types of information to become the precision theranostics and precision imaging strategy. So this is end of my presentation and those are my lectures. Do you have any questions or comments? You can comment on the uh, chatting window. Okay, if you don't have any questions or comments, then I'll close today's lecture. Thank you very much.